All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, colleagues from wherever you are joining us today. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on which part of the world you are in. My name is Yana Aranda, and I'm the director of the Engineering Global Development Team from ASME. And I also serve as the president of Engineering for Change. It is my privilege today to welcome you to this very special webinar in celebration of World Engineering Day for Sustainable Development. World Engineering Day was established to highlight and consider the role that engineers in engineering and technology play in sustainable development, particularly as defined by the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which you see pictured here. The SDGs, as they're short, called for short, represent a unified framework by which the global community is addressing humanity's greatest challenges. Simultaneously technical and social in nature, these goals require high impact solutions, a technical talent pipeline prepared to engage effectively, as well as infrastructure and public leadership to drive implementation at scale. We are now less than a decade away from the deadline set to achieving the SDGs and the need for cross-regional and cross-cultural solutions and the strengthening of global cooperation for the common good has never been greater, particularly at tumultuous times like these. On the second World Engineering Day, we recognize the vital role of engineering, technology, and innovation in achieving the SDGs. The theme for World Engineering Day this year is Build Back Wiser, Engineering the Future. So the topic of engineering a circular economy in the built environment could not be more pertinent. Today's webinar is going to touch on the critical SDGs of SDG 9, Industry Innovation and Infrastructure, as number 11, Sustainable Cities and Communities, number 12, Responsible Consumption and Production, and the most critical of all, 13, Climate Action, which is all enabled through what is represented on this webinar today, Goal number 17, partnerships for the goals themselves. We've co-designed the conversation today with our partners at Habitat for Humanity International's Toyota Center for Innovation in Shelter and have assembled an incredible group of experts and champions around the world who are advocating for the change toward engineering a cleaner, healthier, and more sustainable global community. I will be serving as one of your moderators and we will be introducing our esteemed colleagues shortly. In practical terms, this webinar will be archived on Engineering for Change's site and our YouTube channel. Both of these URLs are listed on the slide you see now in front of you. Information on upcoming webinars is available on the E4C site and E4C members will receive invitations directly. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for future topics and speakers, please don't hesitate to contact the E4C team at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. And if you're following us on Twitter today, do join us with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. Now, some very important housekeeping items, and I see that everybody is already chatting in our chat. Uh, we would like to take a moment to see where you all are joining us from today. So do use the chat window to type in your location. I saw some earlier, so I'm gonna have to try to scroll back up, but hello from Oregon and Minnesota. I'm here in Brooklyn. Hello from India and Ghana. Let me scroll back up to see who I've missed. There is, I saw Uganda and South Carolina, Sri Lanka and Toronto, my hometown, Atlanta and Costa Rica. I see Nepal and Ecuador. Welcome everybody. Welcome from, from Kansas and, and Ghana to the Netherlands. You are all very welcome here today. Um, just as a point of um, administration, do kindly write any comments in the chat. Those are comments that will be for our uh, your, your uh, fellow attendees and perhaps for our panelists, but any questions should go into the Q&A so we can keep track of them and don't miss them. As you can see, the chat is moving very quickly, so we don't want to bypass your questions. Welcome from Rhode Island to Mexico to Turkey. Welcome everyone. So before we move to our presenters, let's tell you a bit about Engineering for Change and ASME. For those of you who may not know us very well or may be meeting us for the very first time, ASME is a nonprofit membership organization which was founded in 1880 for enabling collaboration, knowledge sharing, and skills development across all engineering disciplines. 
Today, ASME has nearly 100,000 members in over 140 countries and has the mission to advance engineering for the benefit of humanity, which is a core mission that has been part of ASME's DNA since the 1880s. And what compelled and propelled ASME to be a core founder of E4C, Engineering for Change, over a decade ago. To meet the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, ASME is fiercely focused on building the workforce of the future, ensuring improved engineering engagement and technological stewardship. We are leveraging an ecosystem of platforms and programs to prepare and mobilize this growing community with our leading digital platform and knowledge organization being Engineering for Change. E4C has been breaking down information silos and democratizing knowledge since 2010 and has grown into a global community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by vulnerable communities. Our perspectives cut across geographies and sectors, including information and communication technology, energy, water, sanitation, transport, health, habitat, and agriculture. Providing pathways to connect, learn, explore, and freely access critical knowledge and networks to advance the social sector. E4C members get a systems perspective of the inextricably interlinked SDGs through access to news and thought leaders and insights on research and hundreds of essential technologies in E4C solutions library. Members also benefit from professional development resources and unique training opportunities such as our E4C fellowship. As I mentioned, E4C is powered by ASME and that would not be possible without visionary leaders and champions like our president-elect, Karen Owen, who is joining us today to share a few remarks. Karen is the 141st president of ASME for the 2022-2023 term and has a, a really tremendous bio. Uh, right now, she is the Associate Director for Finance and Operations at Princeton University Art Museum, where she provides strategic leadership, strengthening, sustaining the process for planning and management. Previously, she has worked as a biomedical engineer in industry, academia, and government, and most recently as a research manager for Home Medica Inc., an orthopedic implant manufacturer. Karen has a storied history with ASME and has been a true friend and incredible collaborator. So Karen, over to you. Welcome. Thank you, Yana, and hello, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you to our E4C webinar, Engineering a Circular Economy in the Built Environment, and to participate in what promises to be a vitally important conversation. Our conversation is one of many taking place around the world today in recognition of World Engineering Day. Engineers have recognized that our profession is the cornerstone in solutions to the climate crisis and achieving the sustainable development goals Yana mentioned. And through events like this today, we are deepening our awareness and taking the lead in the work that we have all come together to undertake. The stakes really can't be higher, and I'm so proud to be part of an organization that is leading the effort to meet what is ultimately the existential challenge of our time. Of all the ways that ASME serves our mission to advance engineering for the benefit of humanity, none does so more directly, nor with more tangible and immediate impact than our engineering for change community. I wanna thank Yana Aranda and her outstanding E4C team, as well as the team from Habitat for Humanity's Terwilliger Center for Innovation and Shelter for organizing this event and assembling such a distinguished and insightful panel of speakers. And of course, I'd like to thank all of our partner organizations and featured speakers for sharing their time and knowledge with us today. On a personal note, these kinds of events are exactly why I am so honored to serve as ASME's president-elect, because the only way we will address the imperative of creating a more equitable and sustainable built environment is by working together. Industry, academia, government, and professional societies all pooling their talent and resources to address this critical problem that threatens the very survival of our species. Finally, I wanna give a shout out to the ASME Foundation, which helps support programs like this and E4C's fellowship and impact projects. Your involvement in the foundation ensures that we will continue to advance the conversation on this topic and grow our E4C program portfolio. 
Again, thank you for participating today and for all you do to advance sustainability in the built environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. We are so honored that you are joining us. So Karen mentioned uh, impact projects and I want to take a moment to speak with you a little bit about what that means. E4C is advancing sustainable development by leveraging our unique community, digital platform and expertise to enable global engineering workforce to contribute their unique talents and service of the SDGs. One of the key pathways by which we do this is our impact projects. This annual program brings together our ecosystem of pragmatic optimists, as we call them, with organizations worldwide to advance shared sustainability objectives across three work streams, impact research, design for good, and advancing workflows. E4C's impact projects are co-designed with diverse organizations ranging from multilateral academic institutions, nonprofits, social enterprises, private sector, and more. To achieve the objectives determined together with our partners, we assemble and cultivate diverse talent around the globe. We lean on the insights and strategic guidance of our global network of more than a thousand multidisciplinary experts and integrate our E4C fellows whom we expose to these urgent issues to train and execute the mix of scholarly work, private sector market research, and human-centered design required to propel the sector forward. For those of you who are not familiar, the E4C Fellowship Program is our distinctive workforce development program in social innovation. During their six-month tenure, fellows benefit from structured online engagement, bespoke training, and program support to ensure that they achieve the key objectives determined with our partners and gain valuable soft and technical skills required for the contemporary working world. The global pandemic has impacted all aspects of our lives and grounded many development programs. Engineers around the world, particularly early career engineers, were working from home and seeking opportunities to contribute their skills for the betterment of humanity. The Digital Native E4C Fellowship Program that we've been running since 2014 provided a vital lifeline to engineers, scientists, and architects worldwide. At the height of the pandemic, our program attracted 650 applications from 80 countries. The 50 fellows that made our 2021 cohort came from 24 countries and nearly 40 nationalities to date have engaged with the program. This year, our application pool has tripled. We closed our applications in early February with over 1,800 applicants from nearly 80 countries once more. To date, we've hosted nearly 150 fellows, 50% 50 of whom are women um, from around the globe. This approach allows us to simultaneously train exceptional rising professionals worldwide, provide a platform for interdisciplinary collaboration and cooperation, and connect a community of thought leaders and peers from every continent. This human infrastructure is critical for realizing the SDGs and more. And with that, I'm very pleased to introduce you to one of our incredible fellows from last year's cohort, who will give us an insight into the circular economy sector. Martin Del Pino is an industrial engineer of the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina, where he's joining us from today with a master, uh, master's in sustainability technologies. And he is going to give us an insight into some of his journey and what circular economy means right now. Martin. Thank you, Jana, for your presentation and hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so, yes, as Jana said, my name is Martin. I'm from Argentina. I have an undergrad in industrial engineering and I recently finished a European master in sustainable development. And I was part of the E4C fellowship in 2021 when I where I worked on an impact research project with the Terwilliger Center of Innovation in Center. Before their fellowship, I had experience working in the affordable housing sector in Latin America. And because of my passion for sustainability, I worked always closely to sustainable, affordable housing initiatives, both on business models and on field, on field implementations. The fellowship for me uh, with E4C and Habitat for Humanity was a great opportunity to merge these two passions in one single project I had the chance to study and understand with a global perspective, both the housing deficit and the waste crisis. During this project, I had the opportunity to work in a multicultural environment with fellows from 22 countries and partners from four different regions. 
this uh, diversity brought me amazing learnings from all the world. Currently, I'm working at McKinsey.org, a McKinsey and company initiative to develop and incubate innovative approaches to the world's most complex environmental and social challenges. I am working as a consultant in circular economy and sustainability. So for me, the fellowship helped me a lot to continue and expand my career in this, path, in this pathway. During the impact research project with Habitat for Humanity, we investigate the major trends and opportunities of circularity in affordable housing in Mexico and Kenya. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so one of the greatest takeaways of the investigation was that the transition to a circular economy is urgent globally, but it is of significant importance to make this transition faster in the global south. It is estimated that more than 3 billion tons of waste will be generating generated in 2050, that is 70% more than current generation. This growth will be mainly in developing countries due to the projected growth in the population and to the necessary economic growth. Developing countries have the opportunity to design their development in a sustainable path, skipping the mistakes done before by developed countries. These reasons are also the ones that suffer the impacts of the waste crisis, with many informal settlements around open dump fields, soil, water, and air pollution due to the lack of regulation, low recover, recovery rates of materials, and very high contaminations, and a very big number of informal waste pickers working in poor conditions and salaries. Next, please. The built environment has a protagonist protagonist paper in this sense. Although sometimes we tend to relate the waste crisis with plastic pollution, the challenge is actually broader. The built environment makes an intensive use of extractive materials, being responsible of 40% of global resources and 30% of greenhouse gases emissions, approximately. In Mexico, to use as an example our research project, the housing sector is responsible of one third of na national emissions, producing almost 40% of the country's waste. Nationally, construction and demolition produces 6 million of tons of waste each year. In Mexico City only, they produce more than 7,000 tons of waste per day, only of construction and demolition, that they end up in landfills or open dump sites. Fortunately, there are a lot of private and public efforts and projects to process and recover more than 90% of these materials and reinsert them into the industrial sector. The challenge will be bigger in the future because of the need to still construct houses and infrastructure to tackle this big existing deficit. Also, there are big opportunities in reshaping the built environment through engineering towards a circular economy. So with this introduction, I give the word to the rest of the panelists and thank you a lot for your attention. Hope you enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Martin, for those insights. And with that, I want to transition to introducing my co-moderator and also another past fellow, Carolina Rojas, who will kick us off with a panel. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, Carolina, she is pursuing her Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering and works now with us as a Fellowship Program Coordinator and as a Research and Administrative Assistant at the Fab Lab at Universidad Tecnológica de Panamá. She has been working volunteering in global development sector and is currently involved in projects that aim to create bridges between people and manufacturing technologies to strengthen the capacity of vulnerable communities in Panamá to develop local solutions to waste challenges by creating eco products and green entrepreneurship initiatives. In that capacity, she also co-founded Reinventa, an NGO led by young professionals who are working with local communities in Panama to promote citizen participation in the circular economy through local waste transformation efforts. She also, in her spare time, which you can see is probably very limited, serves as a technology focal point for the United Nations Major Group for Children and Youth and as a public policy liaison for REEE entrepreneurship. Carolina, I'm so thrilled to be co-moderating with you and turn the floor to you. Thank you, Anna, for that introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on today's webinar, celebrating World Engineering Day. 
Uh, for me, circular economy is a topic I'm very passionate about because of its relevance to achieving Agenda 2030. So I'm very excited to be here in company with an excellent panel of experts. But without further ado, I would like to ask our guests today to take a few minutes to introduce themselves. Um, and I will ask uh, Patrick to go first. Sure, great to be with everyone today. Um, that was a fantastic launch. And by the way, I'm on a lot of widely international calls and, and I think this one is even better. People are from, from everywhere and it's fantastic to see that. Um, but I lead the Terwilliger Center for Innovation and Shelter housed at Habitat for Humanity International. And we focus on market-based innovations for sustainable and affordable housing. And, and just gratitude also to Martin for the work that he's done um, to advance our mission. So thanks. Thank you, Patrick. Glad to have you here. And now I would like um, to ask Nasambi to introduce herself. Hi, my name is Nzambi, Nzambi Mate, um, founder of Jijenge Makers, uh, located here in Nairobi, Kenya. And um, I've been working in the built environment now for plus, plus minus about five years, um, targeting affordable housing with emphasis in affordable materials. Um, this is due to the fact that about uh, 60 to 65 plus minus percent of the cost implication of a construction project going entirely to materials. And uh, as, um, as uh, the previous uh, two previous um, uh, presenters said, as far as the impact of built environment when it comes to CGS, C CHG and um, emissions as far as extractive space is concerned, in this case cement, I'm really honored to work in the space of recycling plastic waste into affordable building materials. And so looking forward to, to contribute to this panel. Thank you, Nasambi. Excited to have you here and sharing your experiences uh, working with Jijeng Game Makers. Um, now I would like to give the floor to Christina to introduce herself. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Christina Contreras. Uh, well, I will say, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation to, as we already hear, very necessary conversation that is happening around uh, circular economy and how to move forward, really. So my profile, I'm a technical architect and a building engineer. And during the last 15 years, I have been very much focused in how to make sure the sustainable infrastructure projects, which at the end of the day are one of the most polluting um, investments and assets that we have are a little bit more green. Uh, so I have two different hats. I'm the founder and managing director of Simpranova, a consulting company working on the sustainable infrastructure space, as well as an instructor at Harvard University, where I teach on a regular basis. In terms of the work that I do through uh, Sinfronova, so we provide a strategic advisory to governments and to companies into very much how to make this transition. We know now that many people want to make sure that they do with the project, but sometimes they don't know how. So besides of that, capacity building has been one of my very much passions for many years now. And that takes me to my work as an instructor at Harvard University, where I was research associate for eight years. And now I teach a class in sustainable infrastructure. I base in Washington, DC, uh, after living for over a decade in Boston. So I'm very happy about enjoying a little bit of a more warmer weather over here. So thank you so much. Over to you. Thank you, Christina. Really very excited to hear your, your different perspectives in the panel. And last but not least, uh, I would like to ask Rick to introduce himself. Hi, thank you. And thank big thank you to Engineering for Change and ASME. My name is Rick Bohan. I'm the Senior Vice President of Sustainability at the Portland Cement Association. And I'm our lead on our roadmap to carbon neutrality. We are, uh, targeting reaching carbon neutrality by the year 2050 throughout our entire value chain. We call it the 5C approach. It starts with clinker, which is the active ingredient in cement. 
cement, which is the key ingredient in concrete. And for folks to, that might confuse cement and concrete, you walk on a concrete sidewalk, your flight lands on a concrete runway. Concrete, of course, is a universal building material. It's used in almost every construction project worldwide, regardless of what type of other material is used. And then finally, our fifth C in our value chain is carbonation. Most people are shocked to learn that concrete over its lifetime actually absorbs about 10% of the CO2 emissions that were generated during the manufacture and transportation of both cement and concrete. So our value chain, sorry about that, our value chain is the five Cs, clinker, cement, concrete, construction, and carbonation. And I'm really excited because we rolled out our roadmap in October and we're in the full implementation phase, moving full speed ahead. So thank you again to ASME and Engineering for Change. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. And thank you, Christina, Patrick, and Nasambi for participating in today's discussion. We are grateful to have you as guests and bring such insightful perspectives to the subject of a circular economy in the built environment. And now that all the participants have had the chance to get to know you better, we'll transition to our round table. And as first topic for our round table, we would like to discuss about opportunities for the sector. So the Ellen MacArthur Foundation proposes that we can reduce CO2 emissions by over 3 billion tons by 2050 if we prioritize the key areas for the built environment. And these are making better use of existing buildings, designing new spaces in ways uh, that eliminate waste, and three, reusing and recycling materials. So all of these areas are necessary uh, to a circular system, but from each of your unique positions in the sector, which should be the greatest priority? And is it different between high and low income countries or rural and urban environments? I will leave the floor open to whoever wants to start uh, the conversation and we'll go around the table. Well, I'll be happy to start if that's okay. So I, I think, I think people might be surprised, but in my opinion, really the highest priority has to be a mindset as opposed to looking at a particular option. And the mindset has to be intentionality. So as we look at the built environment, I think it's critical to decide what we build, when we build, where we build, how we build, What's the purpose of that building? Who is going to occupy it? Who is going to build it? Those are all key issues that we can focus on today. And by being intentional about the built environment, that alone can address a lot of the carbon footprint because now you're taking away the emphasis on whether it's the building materials, the life cycle, all these other things. And now you're taking a whole societal approach. So in my mind, I think intentionality has to be brought into the, the equation of the built environment. And too often that becomes second class to all these other options about cost and, and other issues. So that's, that's my opinion. Thank you. Yeah, so if I can add to what Rick just mentioned, I fully agree. I think that's something that is very much necessary is to have these overview of the system. I think that so often we have been just focusing on one thing and one thing at a time, precisely because the integration is not easy and precisely because the groups of uh, people making decisions in one part might not be the same one that make decisions of another part. But if we talk, for example, and from my point of view, I work in infrastructure, right? And infrastructure today is one of the biggest emitters of greenhouse gas emissions. Around 70% of all the emissions are generated by infrastructure projects, either directly or indirectly. And what does this mean? Well, uh, indirectly is the, the materials that we use for construction. And as we know, and we already hear about cement and steel are one of the biggest producers of greenhouse gas emissions. But those are creators precisely because we need to use them for infrastructure development. But also transportation, where are we bringing these, these uh, materials from? 
and then the construction and the operation for the 30, 40 or 50 years. So I think that it's very important to fully understand the system, to fully understand where are the consequences of making a decision in a given point, and maybe not just narrow in one thing at a time, because at the end of the day, even the built environment and the design of spaces and all the things are an integrated um, strategy that need to be taken as a whole. Thank you. Just to add on to, Go ahead. I'm um, just to add on what uh, Christina say, uh, has said. Uh, also, um, in addition to both the factors that Christina and Rika said, there's also the element of the social economic status, where this narrows down to the point where how do we define um, sustainability in the context of the built environment, of course, understanding the social um, economic um, status and the geography of the places we, we are operating in. So I think for me, just to kind of add on to what Rick said that as far as mindset is concerned, I think it will be also in addition to having the shift also define what it is that change we want. Because um, something I've realized when it comes to matters um, sustainability within the built environment, it's very um, accu accusatory, like people ac accuse, okay, well, the built environment is producing X amount of uh, gas, greenhouse emissions, the built environment is producing X amount of uh, emissions or, or um, climate change uh, effects, negative effects to the climate change. But we actually, don't sit down and, and say, okay, fine, this is the problem. How do we create the solution? Because I get the feeling this is one way in addition to doing the mind change to actually define that all in the context of social economic status and environments, of course. Thank you, Nasambi, Christina, and Rick. I see your mic open again. Christina, is go ahead. Yeah, just a very, very short um, a comment. So I believe that it's also a matter of providing alternatives, right? Because it's very hard to tell people, okay, you cannot drive anymore, but then people still need to commute, right? So what is the alternative that we are providing those people to be able to shift like a low carbon economy, a like low carbon um, um, decision, right? So, and I think that we see this in Europe. I'm originally from Spain. So when it comes to, for example, transportation, people take public transportation because it's safe, because it's efficient, because it's cheap, and because it's very hard to drive in certain cities because there is, there is no parking available, right? So we cannot transfer that model to some other countries like the US because the cities are different and the model is different. And we cannot just say, okay, cars or, we need to change certain things a certain way if we don't provide those alternatives that are gonna help people make the transition within without accusing them from not doing something <laughs> right when they cannot really. Carolina, maybe just real quick too. Yeah, go ahead, Patrick. Totally on those last two and very short too. Um, you know. Zombies, your comment about um, just socioeconomic differences and variations. I mean, in some ways, I mean, I feel like there is an opportunity even for sort of technology leapfrogging. Um, if you look at, for example, Kenya, I mean, Kenya has led the way in mobile banking. I mean, they, they have got innovations that are vastly beyond mobile banking options that are available in industrialized countries. And a lot of that is just because there had not been sort of uh, existing stakeholders that are embedded in existing technologies. So Kenya was able to race past or, or leapfrog those. And, and I think in some ways, when you think kind of more macro about the challenge before us, I think there's an opportunity for uh, emerging markets to in some ways lead on this. Thank you for Patrick and everyone uh, for your contributions. Um, as a second topic, uh, I know we were discussing about this holistic view and looking at pillars. Uh, I would like to ask now questions from your particular experiences. Um, so talking about, for example, green cement and plastics, um, recently we've seen a big upswing in the number of natural 
material-based products in the market, such as bamboo for structures and mushroom, mycelium for insulation and roofing. So Rick and Nesambi, both of your work focuses on improving or rethinking materials that have not historically been considered green or sustainable. So what would you say to the argument that we need to move away from these materials like cement and plastics completely? Well, so the reason why cement and concrete are used almost, well, almost universally in the built environment is pretty simple. Cement, the key ingredient is calcium carbonate. And folks, you've, all, you've already, you know what calcium carbonate is if you've cracked an eggshell, that's calcium carbonate. It is the most common mineral in the crust of the earth. So that's why it's so universally available. Um, I think though that it, what we have to do is if we're looking at the built environment, look at the materials that are being used because whatever material we use, it has to be both sustainable, part of the circular economy, and it also has to be resilient. A lot of people look at concrete as a problem. I look at it as a solution, especially when you get into areas, for example, of where the, the impact of global warming is prevalent, where you have fires, floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, storm surge, all these types of things, you need a very sustainable material. Now again, Concrete can be the solution, provided we're very intentional about, again, how we use it, where we use it, when we use it. There are available solutions today that can address the carbon footprint of both cement and concrete. And both the cement and concrete industries are always working toward reducing that carbon footprint. And if you look over the last 30 to 40 years, We've made terrific progress, and given the technologies available today, we'll continue to make progress. We won't eliminate the use of concrete. It's critical to the built environment. There is no readily available substitute, at least not for the next 30 or 40 years. So that means we have to be judicious about how we use it, and we have to be intentional about how we use it. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. I would like to now pass the word to Nesami. Um, thanks so much. Um, yes, uh, just to echo and add on to what Rick said, yes, we currently don't have um, a practical alternative to the concrete, the Portland concrete that we currently have, um, especially not within the, the vertical building space, um, just because the dynamics there vary. Um, when you go vertically, when it comes to building. Um, and it's with that, that school of thought that uh, made us think, okay, fine. Um, while we do more research and development and uh, figure out what alternatives we can put to supplement in where we can uh, concrete, we are currently working on what um, uh, we popularly call and it's scientifically called polymer concrete, which ideally speaking is now using um, other binding elements or other polymer elements that can um, ideally speaking, act as a binding agent for the concrete element of the binding. Um, and it is that said and done that uh, we now make um, uh, pavers. Uh, popular here in Kenya, they're used for road sidewalk, sidewalks, footpaths, drivers, um, made out of recycled plastic. And this is because the thought process was uh, um, with the, the degree or rather the extent to which we can have an alternative for concrete especially Portland concrete within the, the land, the horizontal space is immense. And so with that said and done, we started making these favors just to try and see, okay, fine, what dynamics um, can we borrow that can act as an alternative? Because at the end of the day, we need an alternative in one way, shape, form or size. And so that's what we started making the favors. And um, what we found out is uh, that not, the dynamics vary, but the output doesn't differ that much. Um, in the context of being in the horizontal space, the pavers, the biggest uh, cost, the biggest uh, factor is in the expansion and contraction and the compression strength. And by the virtue of using polymer, then you're able to um, reduce the air pockets, therefore increasing the, the, the density of the product and the compression strength. 
Um, however, I cannot say that for horizontal space because we have not yet done, we have not yet done um, a test to make an actual building. Um, but I think maybe by the end of this year when we do an actual building block, um, uh, if I can give a feedback, then I'll give. But right now, theoretically, what we found out is um, there are a few dynamics that, as Rick said, we cannot yet fully um, um, supplement uh, concrete. That is mostly in the element of um, the expansion and contraction because, you know, plastic expands rapidly, way faster than, than uh, cement. And also in the element of it being um, polymerous in nature, it reduces the air pockets, which help in the, the house to breathe. And so those are some of the dynamics that we need to figure out. But at this point in time, we have not yet figured it out uh, when we come to making an actual building block. But needless to say, um, we're constantly thinking of what other solutions can we use because one thing is for sure that um, the built environment is here to stay because it's a basic human need that, that we, cannot, we cannot work without. But what we can work is finding alternatives that are not only sustainable, but also affordable, especially within the global South context, because we have a very high, like a big population of the, of the, the biggest percentage of the population is young people. And there's the continuous demand because of the economy, there's the growth, the scale at which the economy is growing, there's an increasing demand of housing. And so this only translates to more demand in cement and concrete space. And so finding alternatives that can supplement in one way or another will be something to watch out for. But uh, until now, I can say what Rick said, we are yet to reach there. And Carolina, if I may just uh, add on to Nzami's comments, concrete provides a, a tremendous opportunity to use recycled materials. So as we look at concrete, not just the fact that it's an important and a critical part of the built environment, but it's also an opportunity for other materials outside of the built environment. So there is a solution there that goes beyond the built environment. And that's what I mean by we take the whole of society approach and be intentional. The built environment can be part of the solution as we progress toward getting to carbon neutrality and addressing global climate change. Thank you both Eric and Nasambi for the contributions and uh, innovations on materials. Um, I would like to bridge now the conversation to infrastructure. So 75% of the infrastructure that will be in place in 2050 doesn't even exist today. It's just to the point of what Nasambi was mentioning. So most of that infrastructure will be built in low and middle income countries, but the construction industry and construction models look different in those markets compared to high income countries. Can you tell us more about the unique opportunities you see for sustainable infrastructure in emerging economies and how might we need to change our focus and approaches to meet these markets needs? I would like to ask Patrick and Christina to contribute at this topic. Sure, I can start us out, Christina. Um, you know, one thing that we think about, so at the Terwilliger Center, we're obviously thinking about residential infrastructure and housing, um, that is our focus. And, you know, a dynamic that is really sometimes mind boggling to some is the extent to which it is, is a very homeowner led process. Um, so for example, if sustainability is a take just in the United States where some of us are, um, you know, you could look at some top builders of residential homes and really kind of push kind of a sustainability agenda with a few corporates, you know, think of Toll Brothers or Pulte or Lennar. And I mean, and you're covering a lot of, of the residential built environment with a few of those, those large companies. And it, it's a much more fragmented market um, in, in most emerging economies. And in fact, so fragmented that it is usually a homeowner led process. And so that, you know, in some ways there's, there's challenges in that. But, but I think there's also a lot of opportunity. But, but I, in both those challenges and opportunities, it, it does become a really important kind of consumer-centric process, right? Um, so so the, the homeowner is going to be making a lot of choices in a lot of the future construction that is going to be happening in the residential landscape. 
Um, so, you know, I mean, there, I've mentioned sort of this whole leapfrogging technology idea, you know, that really does present itself as an opportunity. In Rwanda, you know, we see, for example, flooring alternative. Um, we're supporting a, an entrepreneur, uh, Earth Enable, that is creating sort of a, a compressed earthen floor that has a sealant on it that, that creates you know, a hard floor that can be washed with soap and water and creates a clean environment for children to, to grow up in. You know, and that is a fraction of the cost of cement. But, you know, dirt floors are, are not often sort of the first preference for an aspiring person. I mean, so in some sense, Earth Enable is, is needing to, to not only create the engineering technology for these floors to last, which they, you know, are doing the R&D for that, but they kind of need to make earthen floors cool, right? I mean, they need consumers to, to want those and to choose those. And I think they're on their way. And there's business model innovation in that too, for they're kind of creating these micro franchises where they're going to be able to spread that model. Um, so, so that's a, a big opportunity there. The other thing it just related to sustainability, actually Rick mentioned this, just kind of climate change and weather adaptation. Um, I mean, this whole building more resilient housing is going to be led by homeowners. So the opportunity is there for retrofitting, recycling existing homes, you know, in a retrofitting process to make those more storm and weather, weather resistant as, as we face climate change as society. Um, stop there. Yeah. So yeah, I can add a little bit um, more to what Patrick already mentioned. Also, I think that it's important to recognize that when we talk about the uh, emerging economies, we have huge disparities, right? So we have very sophisticated countries that they are already doing like very well when it comes to defining the policy frameworks to very sophisticated guidelines to, to users and to contractors and to concessioners. And then we have some others that are now just starting and getting a little bit more familiar with that. In any case, and within that range, I think that what we just hear about leapfrogging is gonna be something critical because we already see countries, I have worked particularly in Latin America and that's a region that I'm more familiar with, but they are doing very well in that regard. I mean, I can share a couple of examples with you. For example, something, a project that I, I was working on with the Panama government, they are now defining a methodology to make sure that the public-private partnership of the country and the projects that are structured under that model is aligned with the uh, national determined contributions agreed by the government and agree under the Paris Agreement. So they say, okay, any investment that we are gonna make in the country, we want to make sure that it takes us a little bit closer to what we are already going. The same case with Colombia. Uh, Colombia just released their new policy for the fifth generation of concessions and their modality PPP. And they already have 35 indicators looking at climate, climate, um, climate change, greenhouse gas emission reduction, um, social inclusion, gender equality, um, and materials and so on, that is gonna be a requirement to all the concessionaires that are gonna be operating their infrastructure projects for the 20 or 30 or 40 years to come. And I think that it's also tempting to look at the emerging world and say, how can they improve? But I think that we shouldn't forget that also the developing world, the developed world, sorry, the US, Europe, we have so much work to do. Probably many of you might be familiar with the American Society and the scorecard that they release every four years. They rank all the infrastructure projects in the country. And last year, they say that the infrastructure in the US is a C minus. Probably if you, as you are students, or some of your kids will come home with a C minus, you will not be very happy. So I think that, um, of course, we need to look at what is happening in other contexts, but certainly we we should not forget all the work that needs to be done in maintenance of the infrastructure that already exists and how we guarantee that that infrastructure can transition to a low carbon and more efficient one. Thank you, Christina. 
and Patrick for your contributions. Uh, and there are some questions coming in, uh, but we will be uh, covering a Q&A at the end. I would like to now pass the word to Miana, who has more exciting questions. <sighs> Thank you, Carolina. And I think, Cristina, you set us up really nicely with some of the examples that you shared um, as we're going to transition to talking a little bit about greenhouse gases. So cleaner cities and lower greenhouse gas emissions rank among the priorities of the new urban agenda for 2030. But uh, as of January 1st, uh, if on January 21st, 2030, we see that greenhouse gas emissions have not been reduced in the built environment in a meaningful way, what will be the most likely cause of that failure? Or, or to put it another way, where do you think our sector should redouble efforts to ensure we reach these targets? So I might just pick up on the thread from you, Christina, given the fact that you just kind of ended on that, and then we can go to Rick, Dumby, and Patrick. Thank you so much. Yeah, so at the end of the day, if we look at what are the biggest um, emitters of greenhouse gas emissions, we will have, let be the environment for sure, we will have industry, we will have transportation, all these are heavy or industries that produce uh, a lot of emissions. So I will talk specifically about transportation, and I think that there are representatives about housing and about industry that can talk much better than me about those topics. I think that we still have a very narrow view for example, when we talk about transportation, we believe that one thing is going to solve it all. And now there has been like the boom of electric vehicles, and that's great. But we need to make sure that electric vehicles or any other technology as, are as good as the power or as the energy that powers those vehicles. If that energy is renewable, the electric vehicles is going to be great. If that energy is created with traditional fossil fuels, we are just moving the pollution from the cities to the areas where that energy is being produced. So I think that we need to have a little bit more of an ambitious approach because at the end of the day, we are not doing very well. So, so we need to see what are the reductions that we can have in any different kind of solution that we have access to. So I think that when we come to how we move electric vehicles, certainly is a solution. We need to start looking at public transportation, how we provide public transportation to everyone who needs it. How can we provide not motorized transportation or even how we design or redesign our cities so people can walk on them? Maybe we don't need a vehicles or any transportation to go from one place to another one if the cities are designed in a way that are enablers for people to go to places. And from that, I will pass it to my colleagues. Thank you, Christina. It's an excellent zoom out. Rick? Yeah. So. These are such complex problems and they, they touch on so many different areas. So I, I wanna point out two examples for ex in, in our industry. Um, a lot of people look at carbon capture as kind of a silver bullet. Um, and I hate that because there is no such thing as a silver bullet. I like to say there is silver buckshot, but not a silver bullet. But even carbon capture, as much as, much as that may may reduce the CO2 footprint of any industry, the question then becomes, well, what do you do with that CO2? And that's a really important question that we haven't really addressed yet. But even today, if we could install CCUS, carbon capture at industrial facilities worldwide, people forget there is an enormous amount of energy required to operate carbon capture. So then the question becomes, well, where does, this, where does this energy come from? And in most parts of the US and in most parts of the world, the electric grids that are set up don't have the capacity to provide that energy. Likewise, if we want to install renewable energy at our plants or at any industrial facility, when we don't need that renewable electricity, we then have to send that back into the grid and that's an issue because again, most grid doesn't, most grids don't have that capacity. So that's with carbon capture. Another technological solution that people like to look at is hydrogen. Hydrogen as a fuel is a game changing fuel. It's by far um, the most energy per unit mass than coal, coke, or any other traditional fuel or a transitional fuel like natural gas. So hydrogen looks very attractive. 
in our industry, we really are excited about it because potentially our CO2 footprint, 40% of it comes from combustion. So if we could replace our other fuels with hydrogen, that would be a game changer. But again, the amount of hydrogen we, we would require needs pipelines and it needs, um, you know, if we don't have pipelines and we're going to get it from an electrolyzer, that needs a lot of electricity. Again, the issue becomes much like uh, Christina had talked about, where does this energy come from? So you can't just look at one product in isolation or one industry in isolation. This is a societal problem that requires a societal approach. Absolutely, in a systems perspective, certainly. Um, Zambi? Um, and to just follow up on that, I think then that uh, begs the question of what is the um, what is the um, role that each in each individual, each st stakeholder has to play um, as far as creating a holistic solution? Um, because um, as Rick and Christina have stated, this is not a, just one thing. Um, like we cannot look at it as a one way. We have to look at it as a systematic change. But then if you look at it, the components in the system, both within the built environment and outside the built environment and the intricacies with, uh, that are intertwined with other sectors in the transportation and in the energy sector, poses the question of, should we all together just holistically start rethinking our lifestyle, our life choices, our life culture, and then kind of work backwards? Um, this is just because um, based on uh, on what the, the two have said, if if I want to, for example, to be a homeowner, then I have to think, okay, fine, where is the place located? Um, is it close to work? What is the transportation element to it? What is the emissions as far as um, the CO2 is concerned? And then with that said and done, what, what how can I get the materials to build the house? And then with that said and done, how will I power the house? Or how will I get the energy? Is it through renewables? If it's renewables, then how do I harness that? If it's through grid, then how is that sustainable, especially for the case scenario that it's powered from the fossil fuels? Um, so I think for me, as, as just as an individual, I would believe uh, and I would want um, to hope that um, the solution will only start from a mind shift and then having the will and the goodwill to actually implement from all stakes. Because um, we cannot currently right now say we have the eat solution, but we have we have a saying in my country, haba na haba ujaza kibaba. So what that, that means is like small, 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 small actions will create like a, a big, a big effect, like a greater ripple effect. And so I think it's time we start fighting this problem off slowly by slowly because um, it's definitely an intergenerational solution. So let's uh, buckle up. Yeah, Zambi, I, I love that existential call to action. That's great. And I wish I spoke Swahili so I can repeat what you said, but that's not going to happen. Patrick? Uh, Zambi, buckle up is probably the right word. You know, I've, I've heard multiple mentions of just the importance of systemic thinking. And it may, you know, I always think in some ways of finance as sort of the oil in the system, sort of the oil in the engine. And residential alone, not to mention some of the infrastructure that Christina is, is referencing, but we're looking at a need for $16 trillion of residential investment. So add infrastructure, that's gotta be more than double, Christina. Um, and so I, I do think the finance equation is, is a big part of how to make the system talk to it better. Um, because all those stops, sort of the retail finance, the business finance, right? The infrastructure finance, the public finance. I mean, that really is a, a lever to systems change um, that needs to be thought about more to, to, for effectiveness in this space, I think. This is actually a great uh, bridge to a question that we have specifically for you, Patrick, and the role that uh, you've been playing through uh, the organization that you lead. So a lot of emphasis has been on high income countries in meeting net zero goals or targets. There's also a persistent assumption or perception that sustainable technology is inherently expensive technology and therefore hard to bring to market in low resource settings. Can circular sustainable solutions be accessible and affordable in emerging economies? 
and what would need to change to make this happen at scale? Yeah, I mean, I think those are real problems. Um, I don't think there's a pat answer to that. I, I do think sometimes that is a false choice, right? I, you know, if you look at some of the conversation about bamboo, um, you know, the way cement companies are innovating. I, I, Rick, I agree with you. I, I see a lot of them driving some of the, the innovation in this space. Um, you know, even I think of the cement part in the uh, aggregate components, you know, a huge problem is just the sand shortage. New York Times had this huge front page article on the global sand shortage. And we see in India, you know, that a lot of the commercial real estate projects are cornering the market on river sand, leaving the homeowner to really low quality stuff and their homes are crumbling, right? Um, so, so I, I mean, there's solutions to those. Crushed granite can create a great alternative to river sand as, as an input. Um, so, so I do think a lot of it is coming to engineering solutions. This is the right crowd. You know, there's a, a ton of design that needs to happen too. You know, design and consumer preference thinking. Sometimes I think the engineered solution kind of goes after the technical uh, problem and it doesn't to kind of include the consumer in that equation. Um, and then lastly, you know, the reference to just kind of business model innovation. I mean, I think one of the last mile efforts that a lot of entrepreneurs are taking is bringing things to market in, in a way that makes them appealing, right? And gets a, a consumer to, to select and choose that product or service. And, and that's what we need young, bright entrepreneurs to be creating those opportunities. Um, so again, I, I would not be impeded by sort of that expensive false choice. I think as a society, we need to kind of reject that in some ways. Well, today we are, we are joined by one such exciting entrepreneur who you speak of as, as the promise of the future, and that is Zombie. And Zombie, maybe you could speak to how, how did you get started with uh, Dengue Makers and uh, what opportunity or need did you see and why did you choose to focus on recycling waste plastic for construction materials versus your, your previous job uh, that was in a more, let's say, traditional sector? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so for me, um, I think um, having having have, having had a, a fast row, uh, like a fast row, front row seat um, into the whole source of plastic um, from literally its source, uh, the crude, showed me like uh, what it is we stand to both gain and lose in the both short term and long term. In the context of um, at this point in time, I can with confidence say there is absolutely no sector that plastic has not impacted, whether positive or negative. But every sector has plastic impacted to it. Um, it's only unfortunate that mostly, especially within the packaging sector, that um, it has really redefined everything and transportation and logistics as far as consumer product is concerned. But then the challenge we as uh, the, the engineers and the solution creators and the scientists didn't think about was the afterlife. Now, on this other end of the spectrum, we have this huge need to find an alternative for housing because the demand is ever growing. Here in Kenya, we have a demand of affordable housing units of about 2 million units, uh, and this number increases with about 200,000 units every single year. So then this begs the question, okay, so how do we use this one problem to find to act as a solution to this other problem? Then with that, the said and done that we started thinking because our goal was to impact to convert plastic to impact the basic needs because it, it, it will have to make sense, number one. Second of all, it will have to make a, not just on a, like a structural sense, but an economic sense. And just to add on to what Patrick was saying earlier, it's um, we all need to understand that um, sustainability, yes, there is a cost implication to it and it try to be relatively high, especially when it comes to things sustainable. But then we also need to realize that when it comes to crude and electricity oil 100 years ago or 200 years ago, they were in literally the same position that we are in now because they were then the cutting edge technologies. And so that is just a cost that we all have to pay as people to build the solutions for the future. So with that said and done for us, it posed the challenge, how do we make it affordable? 
If you move fast forward um, a few steps uh, into the discussion, you realize that plastic waste is actually not expensive. What's expensive is the logistic cost. That then is expense. So then we thought, okay, fine, how do we narrow down the logistic cost so that you can be able to make a product that makes economic sense? So that is literally the, the, the dance that we do every day. But how I started was just me a passion, concern, and just having faith that uh, the future will be bright. We need more of that, certainly, in Zambia. And um, it's it's interesting to hear your journey, right? So, you know, kind of on the job observations, your own intuition and insight, understanding of the past. And I'm going to turn now to Christina, because you work closely with and practicing engineers and future engineers uh, in, in your capacity as an instructor at Harvard. And Patrick noted kind of the engineering mindset as, as did, I think Rick touched on it. So how can engineers prepare to work in sectors that are changing and becoming more sustainable using different materials and designs and what resources are available to them to train and how to engage in the circular economy? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So at the, at the end of the day, as we mentioned, engineering is a mindset, right? So you have problems and you learn how to solve them and that becomes very part of second nature. But at the end of the day, engineering is still like taught in silos. So different disciplines, like this is where you work, this is what you learn, and this is the place you have on the chain. And still today, engineers don't have this broad view of how the whole system works. So not until we start training engineers, like, okay, this is where you are on the chain, but you could also, you can also take another position within the chain and you need to learn what's happening before and after. I think that it's gonna be very hard to streamline this circular economy mindset. And there is another element that I, I don't think we have touched very much today. And I believe that is extremely important that is regulations. At the end of the day, when it comes to circular economy, it does very much tie to innovation, right? So, and we are promoting different ways to solve existing problems. But oftentimes regulation is the barrier that we hit again and again and again. And I think that regulation need to keep up with all this innovation because we can have wonderful materials that we cannot use because, I mean, we know, we know cement. We have been using cement for centuries and we know what to expect. But when we need to replace that cement with something different, it's not as easy, even if we all want. So when it comes to new materials, I think that, the, that regulation is something to keep in mind. And that also allows to have the same playing field for everybody, because now there are a lot of engineers and even companies that want to do certain things well, but it's like, okay, what's the incentive? If I'm gonna invest money upfront and somebody's gonna keep doing business as usual, why should I do this? So we all kind of, we, everyone kind of like get comfortable in what we know, unless we are pushed to do things differently. So I would say those two things. Stop thinking in silos and making sure that our regulation catch up to all these wonderful innovations that we have ahead of us. So I want to take that and ask quick a question that's kind of related. So one of the challenges in piloting these new technologies that even if they perform well or better as existing technologies, they don't always fit with an existing building code and standards. Can you tell us more about how performance of low carbon concrete and carbon sink concrete products compares to traditional concrete and the role of material and construction standards in pushing forward or with greener solutions? Well, so in terms of low carbon concrete uh, today, what we're seeing is a very rapid evolution towards um, what's called Portland limestone cements that have 10% less carbon footprint than a traditional Portland cement. Um, these have been around, and this goes really into the issue of standards and specifications. These materials have been around for decades and have been used in Europe for decades. They've been available in the United States for decades, but um, they really haven't been, um, haven't caught on, I would say. And it's not that they're any different uh, than, than the other materials. They have the similar, similar properties uh, of strength and durability except they have 10% less carbon footprint. Well, why aren't, they, why aren't they in widespread use? Well, until recently they weren't, but it took a lot of effort among PCA and others to convince state departments of transportation and others that 
these materials are great and they should be used. That's really a frustration that I have. There are a lot of uh, solutions today that are available today, but aren't being used today, either because there are regulatory disincentives or code related disincentives or standards and specifications. The standard and specification process that we go through to make sure that we have products that can meet standards and specifications it's a very long and tedious process. What we're trying to do as part of our roadmap is accelerate that process. And really this comes down to, and I keep going back to intentionality, but what you've also hear, heard over the last hour is taking a holistic approach. So what we're trying to do is accelerate that process. And by doing that, what we wanna do is incentivize innovation because right now, Unfortunately, what we've done over the years is created this huge institutional inertia. And that's really our biggest obstacle in terms of the built environment. So breaking through the institutional inertia, incentivizing the innovation, and that really looks at these really innovative products that are available today, like Portland limestone cements. And by the way, we'll need new standards and new specifications for materials that are being developed right now, but they don't have that framework. And if they don't have that framework, they won't be included in the building codes. And if they're not included in the building codes, design professionals won't choose them. And if design professionals don't choose them, we don't have the opportunity to reduce that carbon footprint. So again, complex problems all link together, which is why we need a whole of society approach. I keep telling when I talk to the government and others, help us help you. And that's where we're coming from. Thank you so much, Rick. And I, I, love, it. I love the conversation about innovation and new solutions. And maybe, Christina, we can come back to you again. And might you be able to bubble up some of the solutions available now, particularly in resource-constrained environments for sustainable and climate-resilient infrastructure? What would you put into that building code um, if you had the choice. Yeah, that's an interesting question. And also, and I don't know if all of you may be aware of this, but at the moment, the US is has drafted a standard for sustainable infrastructure. It was developed by the American Society of Civil Engineers and has been in commentary for the last year and a half. That's going to be pushed in the next month. So this is like good news, right? So we are finally changing those frameworks that somehow doesn't allow us to incorporate all the good innovations that we are seeing. In any case, and back to the question, I think that still today, there is a very real green premium that at some point will need to disappear. Because if we have the perception that to do things sustainably and resilient, is way more expensive than to do the traditional way of business, then it's really hard to say like, okay, we are constraining resources, but you still need to take the expensive option. So I think that we need to make sure that we scale up solutions in a way that at some point is business as usual. I always extrapolate this with what happened to, for example, safety in the construction side. 30 years ago, it was like, okay, uh, this was like the, the extra thing, right? Why do I need to wear like a helmet on the contract? Now there is no question. Every construction site needs to have uh, the standards for safety in the, in the workplace. This is the same. Once sustainability becomes at the scale that every project is sustainable, then we are not going to be even having this conversation because they, the other solution uh, is going to be feasible anymore. Yana, if I could just oh, sorry, add on please. just one more point, and it's a little specific, but you know, one really simple thing that we could do would be to allow the shift from prescriptive specifications to performance-based specifications. So prescriptive specifications talk about, it's a recipe. You need this type of chemistry, this type of um, material properties. Whereas performance specifications focus on what is the desired result you want? What is the strength you want? What is the durability you want? 
those performance-based specifications, again, have been around for decades. Shifting to those allows us to actually reduce carbon footprint today and still have the strength and durability we need in the built environment. That's one really critical thing that we've, we've been um, lobbying for, for, again, for decades. Thank you. That's a really great insight, Rick. Thank you for sharing that. So as, as Christina also noted, the, you know, this green premium, the, the challenge about scaling solutions is something that we have to be mindful. So I'm gonna turn to you, Patrick, and, and your work with Habitat for Humanity and the Taroga Center, you're helping bring affordable circular solutions to the housing market by supporting entrepreneurs with connections, knowledge, visibility, and capital to bring their innovations to scale. Can you tell us more about the gap in the entrepreneurship ecosystem that your team is working to address through Shelter Tech and specifically the Shelter Venture Fund? Sure, happily. Um, you know, actually, Nzambi is a great, a great profile. She, she is one of the entrepreneurs that we are quite proud of. But, but essentially the story on this is, you know, the emergence of the social entrepreneur has become somewhat important to the world, right, over the last 10 years or so. And, you know, I, there has been a lot of support for a number of different social issues to be met with entrepreneurship. And there's, you know, reference to food tech, health tech, ed tech, you know, um, ag tech, those, those are all almost commonplace now. Um, so when we were out there and, and really the Terwilliger Center began working, you know, with construction companies and banks and, you know, those that we saw sort of honestly more important systemically to the residential construction environment. But we, we kept encountering almost by chance kind of these entrepreneurs who were really just kind of working it and, and, and developing new innovations and solutions. And, and so we, we kind of eventually were like, isn't there an accelerator you can go to or who's helping you? And basically we, we sort of saw this issue being overlooked by the innovation and entrepreneurship space. Um, and, and so we, we kind of took it upon ourselves, like who's, who's gonna do this? Who's gonna kind of drive this? So we started Shelter Tech, which is an accelerator for entrepreneurs in the residential built environment space. Um, and we created a venture capital fund as well to, to finance those companies. I think one thing really important to all of that work though, is honestly, if Habitat for Humanity is the largest accelerator and investor in this, we're in trouble. Um, so if we have really dedicated all of this work to being as catalytic as possible, you know, even hoping someday that, that we can make an exit, that, that other large acceleration platforms take on housing and the built environment as an issue and begin to even look for some of these entrepreneurs themselves. So, so we've actually, we started with an accelerator, Shelter Tech, which we, we're still doing one in Africa this year. It's a pan-African version of that accelerator. But maybe more importantly in the long term, we're creating these Shelter Tech tracks that other accelerators can take on. So, you know, if it's another existing village capital of Metaprop or, you know, Brigade Reap in India, we can help them take shelter and housing as a track that they would do within their own accelerator. Um, likewise, within our Shelter Venture Fund, we try not to be the sole investor. We, we like to lead rounds and bring other VCs in so that, that these entrepreneurs in the built environment space are, are not just getting access to our capital, but to a range of VCs that then lead them to yet another round. So we're pretty excited about that space. And, and we think the entrepreneurs that we are finding are fantastic and deserve more attention and capital for their ideas. Thank you, Patrick. As um, we lead also um, on hardware-led social innovation accelerator at ASME, our iShow, so similar feelings about the incredible promise of social entrepreneurs like Zombie who are really breaking the mold and pushing the envelope and challenging our mindsets, right? Really critical. So um, I know there's so much chatter and so many amazing questions that have poured in and uh, we wanna now turn to the audience q and I'm gonna tell you up front, I don't think we're gonna get through all of them because there are so many, but um, I'm going to have Carolina um, share a few questions that we've selected. 
Thank you, Yana. So looking at the questions for some of them, there's a trend on interest on answering questions on social justice and critical inclusion. Um, there's a question from um, Tomeka Carroll, and she says, because of because most of the impact of global warming and built environment issues present challenges to the global majority, which are people of color in the US and worldwide, she asked, how should we approach finding a solution while listening to their voices? So often those who are not impacted directly are at the forefront of finding a solution. I know Rick, you provided a question, but would you like to um, add something live for the rest of the proceedings? Thanks. Sure. So uh, one of the, the answer that I gave regards the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, they have a program called Environmental Justice. And you can actually go on their website and there is an interactive map that I believe there are 16 criteria for what an environmentally justice, what that looks like. And to show a disadvantaged community in terms of environmental justice. Um, I would encourage folks to go there because there's not one single definition, but rather a spectrum of, of uh, a spectrum of choices there that include things like the access to public education, the, uh, the education level of that community, whether that community has access to clean water, et cetera. That's really a, a very good starting point. My point, though, is that both EPA and local communities have, have used the environmental justice tool to screen, to make sure that people aren't disadvantaged by the industries within their communities, or that communities don't get disadvantaged when an industry wants to move into their geographic area. This is a critical issue. And for too long, it's been neglected. But again, this really deals with the concept of environmental justice. And I would encourage people to go to EPA's website because I think they're the leaders in that particular area here in the US. Thank you, Rick. Anything anyone else would like to add to that? Thanks, Carolina. I think that I, <laughs> I, I have to contribute because at the end of the day, infrastructure is one of the biggest distractors of uh, social uh, environments around the world, right? So we know that infrastructure is necessary, but unfortunately, we have had so many different failures in the past from building hydropower plants in the Amazon that is disrupting uh, local communities and indigenous groups to well, all around the world very much. I will say that in the last years, there has been a huge movement um, in order to say, okay, how, since infrastructure is necessary, how can we do it more equitable and more gender inclusive? And now there is like, even as, as uh, Patrick mentioned before, financing is the oil that makes the system run. So even today for many investors in infrastructure, the fact that projects ensure that they have gender plans into their projects is one of the first requirement to be able to access finance. And I will give you just one example. Uh, with the Green Climate Fund, many of you might be aware of it. This is the fund that was set up after the Paris Agreement to kind of like raise money to invest in sustainable and resilient infrastructure in low developed countries. Uh, one out of the five things that they as for it's like the institution that this fund is going to give money to, this is a $10 billion fund, you need to have a gender policy in place, no questions. Not, you cannot even apply for funding if you don't have that as, as a first step. So I think that we are going to see more and more um, kind of attention being drawn to these topics as well as social justice. And one last thing before I, I, I give it back to Carolina. So based on a study that I had the opportunity to work a couple of years ago, we analyzed 200 projects that have gone wrong. So trying to understand what were the consequences of conflict associated to infrastructure projects, the first driver is poorly done stakeholder engagement process. So once the, the machines move to the land and it's like, okay, now we have the communities protesting on the side, that's precisely because nobody has explained them properly what are the consequences of the project or what is gonna be done there. So I will stop here.
a topic that probably we can organize another another whole webinar on it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. And I think on the same topic, there's a question here that maybe Nasambi, I think you are uh, you could you can answer it. It is how important is including social justice in circular economy and engineering education frameworks for future innovators and engineers in order to help change mindsets? Um, I think that um, should be and will be the new normal. Um, that is in the context of uh, it is obvious um, the way we've been operating, it is, um, it's creating an imbalance to the point where it is almost uh, that, like uh, the human existence uh, is mutually exclusive to having a harmonious engagement with the environment. And those two things need, need not to be mutually exclu exclusive. And for us to make sure that they are mutually inclusive, we will need to engage uh, social justice elements in every sector and in every um, spectrum, whether within the social uh, spectrum, whether within the economic spectrum, or even the political and governance spectrum. Um, and one thing that is really common, and it's very really often, and uh, I think um, uh, Patrick was the one who said it, the finance is the oil of this system. And so if we can have, uh, if we can have um, a, a, a cost implication that is of pro uh, social justice and it's pro economic justice, as far as the environment uh, matters is concerned, then it incentivizes people, the need to include these um, elements in the system. And speaking within the context in Kenya, um, we have, we have, we have seen, um, in the case in the case scenario where we have governments so when when it comes to matters environment the government has used two strategies one it's either one of punitive measures or the other one is of rewarding measures so punitive measures in the context of when uh, the government wanted to plan to ban single use plastic we had fines of almost six months just for carrying uh, six months in jail just for carrying a plastic bag, and then on this other spectrum, you find that well, if you're in the environmental uh, impact uh, space and the sustainability space, you get some sort of incentives. And uh, what we've realized is um, both system you need both uh, elements, but uh, the rewarding element is more fulfilling and it's more long term. And so my hope and prayer is uh, if we can follow that route, then we can input such um, elements because it's uh, the new normal. I love your comment, Nasambi, on the new normal. Um, and on that note, uh, I'll pass on the word to Iana to close and maybe what could be our new normal moving forward after this discussion. Oh, I, I find that so inspiring as well, Zambi, and I think incentivizing uh, changes in mindsets is absolutely where we need to go. I'm personally hopeful that this conversation today is in fact doing just that, that we are inspiring and, and engaging this global audience that we've assembled today to rethink our approaches to the built environment and shifting mindsets for a more sustainable practice and a more sustainable engineering at large. With that, I know we are at time. I, I do apologize for anyone whose questions we did not address. We will try to tackle them in follow-up uh, news. But with that, I wanna thank each of our panelists. You have been, each of you, tremendous in, in your insights, such gems here that I, I'm just really genuinely excited. I'd like to thank Martin for kicking us off with uh, laying the foundation, and of course, Karen, for welcoming you all. And I wish you all a good afternoon, a good evening, a good morning, wherever you may be. And again, happy World Engineering Day. The future is bright with all of you leading the way. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.